Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 712 of the podcast and it is Wednesday the 6th of September 2023 as I record this. In today's in between episode, I'm talking with Damon Freeman from De Monza about using AI images as part of the book cover design process, something I know many of you are already doing or at least thinking about. We talk about using AI tools as part of the creative process, how mid-journey works. We discuss aspects of copyright, although, of course, we are not lawyers, so this is just our opinion, as well as how AI tools are enabling the creation of unique cover images that have been almost impossible before, or at least very, very difficult. And if AI will be able to do everything, how will creatives make a living? plus tips for working with your cover designer if you want to incorporate AI images. Now, I've used AI images on every book cover this year. My short story, With a Demon's Eye, and also on Catacomb, and soon to be published, Writing the Shadow, all are composite AI image covers. So essentially, I made a whole load of images on the pro version of Midjourney with the commercial license. I pay for it, so I have the commercial license. And then my human designer, Jane, uh, basically puts the various images together to create the final cover. And I've I've included some pictures uh, of the original images and the finished covers in the show notes, along with a lot of links, because Damon and I talk about things. And in the transcript, as always, there's a transcript. I'm, I've am i linked to a lot of the articles that we both refer to. So please take a look at the show notes if you want to delve in further. The show notes are always on the blog at thecreativepen.com forward slash blog or linked at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast and you can click through, read the transcript, uh, click the links and decide for yourself. Damon has also written some great articles about the use of AI images in book covers and refers to some other ones. So check the show notes for the links. One thing he said is really important. He said, I started doing a lot of research into generative AI and really trying to form my own opinions. This is what you must do too. I don't expect you to accept my opinion and we don't expect you to accept Damon's either. But also don't accept the people who tell you point blank not to use AI in any way. You need to do your own research, understand how the technology works, which is where so much of the issues come from right now. People make these massive statements without actually researching how the technology works and then decide on your own opinion. Now, of course, even if you don't want to use AI images on your book covers, you might consider using them in advertising, as I'm doing for my fiction at the moment on Meta. And I've shared a video on how I use Midjourney with uh, my patrons on patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. And of course, thank you to all my patrons who support these in between episodes. If you support the show, you get the monthly Q&A, which is like an extra episode really of the podcast where I answer your questions on writing, publishing, marketing, making money as an author, and of course, AI. Plus, we're having a patron meetup at 20 Books Vegas. So if you are coming to the conference and you support the show as a patron, there are lots of benefits. You can support the show for not very much, less than a coffee a month at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Also, on using AI images for advertising, I'm thrilled to discover that Mark Dawson is now recommending this. In fact, Mark and James Blatch are doing a free webinar on how to create AI images on Midjourney for your advertising. You can sign up at thecreativepen.com forward slash AI webinar 23. It's on the 13th of September, 2023. So this is short notice. It's next week as this goes out. But they're also including AI images for ads in the Ads for Authors course, which is launching. So I'll make sure this link redirects after the webinar. 
you can register for your free place at thecreativepen.com forward slash AI webinar 23. Also, please remember, if you have questions, I don't do tech support for AI tools. (laughs) If you have questions and you have an AI positive attitude, you can check out the Facebook group AI Art for Authors, where you can find lots of resources, tutorials and authors doing amazing things. Just search AI Art for Authors on Facebook and that is it's a free group, but you do need to have an AI positive attitude. Right, let's get into the interview with Damon. Damon Freeman is the founder and creative director of demonza.com, creating custom book cover design and interior formatting for authors. So welcome to the show, Damon. Thank you, Joanna. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to chat and really looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, me too. So we're going to talk specifically about AI images as part of the design process today. But first up, tell us a bit more about you, your design background and how you've been working with authors for over a decade. I trained as a graphic designer and I was working in normal graphic design sort of businesses. I started my own company as a general kind of graphic designer many, many years ago. And uh, over time, it you know, it was going pretty well. But in around 2007, with the global financial crisis and all of those kind of things, that kind of everything just started falling apart and it wasn't going well. And out of desperation, I started looking at other potential opportunities and I found a website which maybe you've heard of or or some of the authors have called 99designs.com and I started pitching different kinds of design work on there to try and earn a bit of extra income and one of the kinds of work projects I was I was pitching on were obviously book covers and I, I, I started getting quite a good hit rate on the covers so as you may know they only pay the designers that they select their work for so you you might be doing graphic design work and you put in all the effort and then your cover doesn't get picked and that's it so i i found i was getting quite a good win rate for book covers so i just started doing a few more of them and eventually i I just sort of took over and i i stopped my normal day job and i just started focusing exclusively on on book covers and that was in about 2010 or so so in 2011, I started the website, monza.com, and it was just me doing book covers. And I was fortunate in that because of the way I'd done things before, I had quite an extensive portfolio of book covers. And I put them up on a website. And for a while, the website existed, but nothing happened. And it's just it's slowly, slowly, I started picking up work and picking up authors and picking up clients. And eventually, it grew quite a lot that I had to start looking at at how I could service all of these clients. So I brought in somebody that used to work for me before as a graphic designer, and she started helping with the book covers. And it slowly grew from there. And now I oversee a team of designers and we've got project managers and the designers I work with are all all over the world, but they've been working with me for many of them for seven or eight years now. Mm -hmm. And we're happy team, work well together. I still oversee all the work that goes out. Occasionally, I'll do some of the designs myself. If it's a tricky one, then I might choose to go do it myself. But generally, designers that I've got working for me now are amazing, often producing work that's much better than what I could do. (laughs) That's brilliant. So do you have any idea like how many book covers would you have done uh, since you started Demanza? Oh, well over 10,000. Right. I mean, that's what I thought, because I know you've been in the space for a long time. We've been connected for a long time, although we've never spoken before today. So this is quite cool. But so clearly you're really experienced. The team is experienced. And yet some would say, like, why are you so interested in AI? I mean, you've got loads of skills. So why did you want to explore AI when it has been, well, still is pretty contentious in the art community and the author community? Well, initially what happened was that one of the designers on the team, she had noticed that on some of the stock image websites that we use Shutterstock, and she had noticed on Shutterstock that there were new kinds of images cropping up. They all kind of had a, I guess they had a distinctive look to them, but they were really interesting. They were kind of unusual. They weren't a normal, they weren't like a photograph and they weren't, they didn't really look like a 3D rendering. They were kind of something in between. And she just told me she'd found 
mid journey. And she said, look, look at these images. This is the software, I guess. This is the program that's being used to create these images. And uh, I looked into it and she wanted to know now, can she use <laughs> mid journey to create images? So not really knowing how any of it worked, right? Seeing that it was AI, but not really knowing how it worked. I checked the terms and conditions. I saw, right, fine. If you pay, you get a commercial license and you can use these images. So I said, sure, we'll get the license and she can use them. And really in the beginning, it was just backgrounds and landscapes and those kinds of things. Because I guess earlier on, people and those kinds of images, they didn't look very good. They weren't there. But, but so it was kind of just small bits and pieces we started using. And that was it. So I didn't think at the time it wasn't contentious, right? It was just another place to get images that we could license. But obviously it went on from there because if things have moved really fast. I mean, I also got on my journey. So we're recording this August 2023. So important to timestamp these AI episodes. <laughs> but when I got on to my journey about a year ago, as you said, there was the joke around fingers and yeah. photos having weird stuff. And where we are now, it's like an, a completely different world in terms of how far it's come. So tell us what are the different ways that you're using AI tools now? as part of the creative process and how have things changed, I guess, over the last year? How how have things moved on? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess what happened was we still weren't using it that much, right? For, for quite a long time, it was really just the, the one designer and you couldn't really tell where she was using it. It wasn't sort of obvious. It was always maybe a background or something like that. And you couldn't really tell, but what was happening was that we, we it kind of became clear that it was getting better at what it was doing. And she, this designer, <laughs> was starting to question me more, saying, can she use it for this? Can she use it for that? And I started to to kind of look into it a bit more. And I thought, wow, these are pretty good. And it was quite interesting. It was probably in the same week or two that I said, yeah, all right, we can start using this a bit, a bit more, that I received two emails in the same week from two authors who said, are you using AI images in our covers? And if you are, I don't want you to, right? I mean, that's how it happened. So we were barely using any AI images and I hadn't really thought about it. It, it had been in our terms and conditions from the beginning that we might, might use these AI images from the journey, but we hadn't made it explicit, right? That we were, because we weren't really. So, when that happened, I looked into it much more. And that's when I also then started doing a lot more research into generative AI and really trying to form my own opinions on, on kind of should we use it, what is it really, those kind of things. So, and that, I mean, that's where I found a lot of your podcasts, a lot of your articles. I found a great article, which I've referenced to myself quite often with from James from goonright.com. Really, really great. I thought it clarified things very, very well for me. So that was the point where we immediately sent out something to all our authors, all our clients with this saying, look, we might be using this. We think we sh should use it. We like it. But if you don't want to use it, we won't. And it was actually at that point that I then briefed in all the designers saying, look, this is how Mid Journey works. And if it's is suitable for a cover that you're working on, then, you know, go for it. These are the restrictions. So don't, you know, don't mention a real person's name, whether it's an author or a named style. So we don't want to copy anyone or anything like that. But this could be a way to, to source images that are just not available as a stock photo. The problem has always been that they are limited stock photos. Even though there are a lot of them, they are limited. And when you're working on book covers and certainly in particular genres, they start to get, I mean, we try not to reuse stock photos, but you start to see the same stock photos on many different covers and for, by, by different designers and different authors. So we kind of saw it as a way to differentiate a book cover and start to come up with designs that we never could have come up with before just because those stock images don't exist. And so we started to use it more and more, and we made it much more explicit on the website. So with the order form where you can, 
opt out of the AI images. We put why we think you sh shouldn't opt out of using, potentially using AI imagery. Just because it exists doesn't mean you have to use it. And uh, we've kind of just gone from there. Lots of things to unpack from that. The first thing I want to address is you said there's limited stock photos, particularly in some genres. And I love that you mentioned this because it's like these tools create things that don't exist. So I have a cover, which is a female combat photographer. And there were no pictures of female combat photographers. Like it's just a male dominated field. I mean, there yeah. are some, but they're not represented. And of course, people of color, uh, people with disabilities, there's a whole load of different people, let alone settings that are not represented. So what are some of the things that you find amazing? I guess, what are some of the brilliant things that you've been able to do because of AI art? Well, we used to have a uh, we used to have an additional fee on our design work that we really tried to discourage authors from going with because it was very, very difficult and it normally didn't work out that well. It was if they wanted to create a very specific character, to use your example, let's say a female combat photographer, which on its own we could possibly make work. But when you had this character and she had to be in a specific position maybe she's lying on the ground taking this photo right mm -hmm. and she's wearing particular clothing and she's a certain type of camera or whatever it might be those kinds of things to create using stock photos are impossible so we try to discourage authors from from i guess being that specific on what they wanted on their covers and we did that by adding a character creation fee but really what that meant was that we would sort of try Dr. Frankenstein style to cobble together a person out of different images, out of different, the, one woman's arm, another woman's head, another woman's body, another person lying down. It's very time consuming. It's very, very time consuming, very, very difficult. And it, often it doesn't really work because mm. stock photo is limited. You know, the light is coming from one direction on one photo and it might be coming from a different direction from another photo. Well, the angle is the camera angle is a little bit too high or too low on one of these images. So it was very, very difficult. Now, with generative AI, suddenly that's not a problem anymore, right? We, we can just generate an image that might not be exactly right, but instead of cobbling together five or six different images, maybe we can generate one or two, put them together and incorporate a stock photo of a particular kind of camera whatever it might be, right? And that becomes much, much easier, which means we don't have to, we can do more with the cover, right? And those kind of things. And we don't have to charge an extra fee for it. So that's a good example. Another one is when certain kinds of covers, let's say action thriller covers, where we must have designed 200 covers of a man in a suit running down the road. You know, back <laughs> oh, that old road, one. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We get so many, we get, we still get many, many authors. That's what they want. That's what they like. That has got a lot of excellent genre sig signalers for, for potential readers, right? Mm. I get it. It's great. We love it. But there are not that many stock photos of that kind of image, right? Maybe there's 20. And even if there are 20, that's not enough. <laughs> so with generative AI, we can generate 10,000 different versions of that that all look different. Right. And that are all original and never been seen before. Yeah. And I mean, that to me, it's like you said, you can, well, we should, let's explain because some people listening may not have used <laughs> Mid Journey or any of these tools or may not have seen a tutorial. And obviously, this is a visual tool. So it's quite hard to explain. But you did mention that you learned how Mid Journey works and you became happy with it from a, a creator perspective and an IP perspective and you also mentioned the restrictions not using a person's name an artist name and or a named style like disney like i always say this to people too like don't use other people's names don't use ip yeah. brands you can just use your words but can you explain how it works to people who've never seen it and how you can generate 10,000 images just like that sure well I'll let me i'll first tell you the reason why i when I kind of investigated why I personally do not think there are any ethical or copyright concerns with the way that it's 
trained. And it's quite specific. Well, maybe it's not, but I think it's quite specific to what we do, right, with book covers. In that when an author is briefing us on what they want, they give us examples, right, of book covers they like. They might send us a Pinterest board or email us images of covers or movie posters, or they'll send us a picture of Matthew McConaughey and they say the main character looks like him and whatever it might be. Now, those are copyrighted images or they haven't purchased those images to send to us or whatever it might be, but they're effectively training us, right, the designers, on what they want so that we can create a cover that's inspired by those but not copying those. And when I looked into Midjourney, that's pretty much what it's doing, albeit with millions of images, but it's effectively the same thing. If I could look at millions of images at the same time, and I probably I feel like I've looked at millions of book covers and learned from them on, on, on how to create book covers, kind of it fit in with the same thing that we were doing, which is why I've never had an issue with it. In terms of the way that Midjourney would work, is that as an example of let's say that a man running through the street. So we might go into Midjourney or Discord and we might say, imagine a cinematic film still of a man in a suit running down the street, backlit in the streets of New York, whatever it might be. And we'll get four options of that that have never been seen before. And we might choose this one and make a few changes to it. We might make variations of that or anything like that. So, And then we'll get the output that we want. Then we'll have a man running down the street and we'll put him on our cover. But now perhaps the story is, there'll be other elements to the novel, right, that we will use stock photos for still, just because it's more convenient really to find an image of a of, of some kinds of images, and images of a street scene, for example, than to create an image of a street scene that, takes a few seconds or a minute or two, but might not be right. And we have to keep doing it until we get the right one. Sometimes it's just easier to to search for a stock photo. So we're combining the generative AI images, the images created with Midjourney with stock photos, and then incorporating text until ultimately, and whatever effects we might have, until ultimately we get a cover that we're happy to present to an author. Mm. Yeah. And like you mentioned, I think the film still or movie still, I use that as quite a lot of my prompts that I'm doing for yeah. ads, for example, because they're really thriller movie still, two people running with the Vatican in the background. Uh, although I've tried things like the Vatican, uh, St. Peter's Dome blowing up and that it doesn't like that. So it, <laughs> you could, there's definitely some restrictions. But as you say, it's a collaborative process in that this is what I also do with my designer, Jane Dixon Smith, is that I send her. So I used to send her, like you said, pictures of other people's covers and say, yeah. these are the things that I think resonate with the book. But now I use Midjourney and I generate maybe 50 images or of all different kinds, backgrounds, because I love using Midjourney. I find it so much fun. I find it like a really creative, fun process. And then I say, these are, this is my mood board, the mood board I created. And then what she's doing is, as you said, using elements of those images, using some other things from stock and also doing fonts. So it feels to me like a, a really collaborative process. And can you just comment on the copyright of the output of the finished book cover compared to the copyright of a stock photo? Right. So in the US which is really where most of the authors are that we work with, you cannot copyright a book cover that's been created with a stock photo because the photographer owns the copyright of those stock photos. And those stock photos are being used by multiple people who are paying the license to use those images. So you can't copyright a cover that's been made with it. It doesn't matter how much you've change them you've used the other person's stock photos in you in the u.s and you can't copyright it. the same way if you're using licensed fonts those fonts belong to somebody else you didn't create those fonts you can't copyright the cover with those fonts and those images so the fact is you can't copyright a book cover in the u.s with generative ai images it's 
I guess more of a, a little bit more of a gray area because I believe if you've done, if you've made enough changes to it, then perhaps you can, right? But we have never copyrighted any one of the 10,000 covers that we've designed and we've never had to provide anything for any of our authors for them to do it, right? It's just never, it's never come up. At the end of the day, the readers are not buying the book cover, right? They're buying the book. The cover is just an ad, right, for the book. It's just an advertisement for the book. So in my mind, it's never been necessary to copyright a book cover. The same, you know, the, the product isn't the cover. The product is the book, and the book is what can be and should be copyrighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, I think there's the license to use as a book cover is what we should say the authors have. So when yeah. you as a designer, when you license a stock image from Shutterstock, you have a commercial license to use that in a book cover, for example. Right. But so then you grant the author the right to use that as part of the payment for work. That's basically how it has been working. And then yes. with Midjourney, as you said, if you pay for Midjourney, like $10 a month, whatever it is, $20 a month, you get the commercial license. And it, but again, I think of it in the same way, which is I don't, even though some people say you do, I don't think you have a copyright on that image. But just as you don't have a copyright on the image from Shutterstock, you then combine those images into a composite and that becomes the image that you use. I think the difficulty for authors is that we don't have legal training and you're not a lawyer either, right? <laughs> Right. Yep. So, yeah, so we these are difficult terms. And I feel like with the AI side, the word copyright has become quite inflamed and a lot of people don't understand what lies behind it. So I'm just going to point people to a couple of the interviews I've done before, including one with an intellectual property lawyer. So we are not lawyers. We're not commenting on this. It's also really different by country. Because here in the UK, we do have a copyright law that does say works generated by machines, basically, are the copyright of the person who created them. So have you looked into this in New Zealand? No, I haven't. We, I wonder if there the is anything. Day, mm. At the end of the day, uh, we look at the terms and conditions of the stock photo sites we use and Midjourney. Midjourney is, they retain the right to use the images you create themselves. So it's kind of difficult for the creator to have a copyright on it because, I mean, I guess because they're just taking the right to use the images, right? So although they could do it, people are generating millions and millions and millions of images a day. I don't see that as an issue. And for us and for anybody who has a pro license, they really should be generating the images on a private server where nobody else can see them and no one else can use them. So the copyright itself, I mean, it's kind of, in a sense, it's worthless, right? Because, mm. <laughs> because what is anybody going to do with it? What if Once you can start creating any image you want, why would you need to copy somebody else's? And that's how I think about it. I've been very open about my use of AI for images, and I've done blog posts about it and all of that. And why would you copy my image? Why would you take my image when you can generate your own? <laughs> basically yeah. Yeah. I mean that's what's so crazy right I mean it, what is yeah I think people that, that we have to separate the two things the training of the models is something that will be fought in various jurisdictions but what I think will happen is there will be some kind of payout eventually to somebody but we'll all carry on and then each jurisdiction has these different rules but as long as we are open and honest about it, that, and that's why I really wanted to talk to you, is because you put these blog posts out, you're being very open, because to me, there's we're proud of this. This is great fun. It's really creative. It's super creative. It, it, it's expanding the potential of what we can do. So why would we hide it, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I put it out there because I needed to... It was becoming a thing, right? It, it, mm. it was suddenly becoming something that people were talking about. And it was something that affected us. And I needed to just, yeah, be open and honest with how we are going to be approaching this. I knew at the time, putting them out, right, that lots of people may disagree. But I kind of thought at the time, and still now, is that people are still forming their opinions, right? They, yes. They're not yeah. sure which kind of which way to go. And 
I wanted to put it out there that cover designers are still artists, right? And as artists, we agree with this. We think it's a great thing. This allows us to do much, much more. And um, yeah, I, I think it's a great thing. It's very positive about it. And uh, mm, I hope absolutely. It carries on. Yeah, and it's only going to get better. Well, on that, you've mentioned mid-journey. You also mentioned that Shutterstock has its own sort of AI image category, and many of the stock sites are doing this now. What's so funny about Getty's legal case against mid-journey, oh, yeah, mid-journey and stability, right? I think it is. I'll put it in the show notes. But they, <laughs> at the same time as doing that, they're rolling out their own AI image, obviously based on their own images. But yeah. Adobe Firefly, sorry, Adobe Photoshop has also said that they will support any legal cases that come up around any AI images generated by their own engine, and they have Firefly. So, I, I mean, what other thing developments do you see? Because I, I think within six months to a year, there won't be a design tool that doesn't have AI in it. <laughs> I mean, how can a designer avoid this if it's going to yeah. be in every single tool? Yeah, I mean, look, they can't, right? They can't. But I do think there's different ways that it's being used, which are are really interesting. I mean, so there is, I guess, the normal mid-journey style generative AI that is part of the new Photoshop beta, right? But we never use it, right? It exists, but it's not anywhere near as good for now as mid-journey. And we don't use it. However, Well, things like filling in the gaps, right? Or a real good example is if you need to turn a normal ebook cover into an audiobook cover. The Adobe Photoshop's new generative AI tool is amazing because it can just seamlessly (laughs) make your background, whatever it is, fill out the space that is needed for the audiobook cover. And Things like that, which is a form of generative AI. It's not as flashy and interesting, I guess, as the really creative outputs that you might get. But it's um, amazing. We've actually, for quite a long time, and it is a form of AI, which also we didn't really think about. We use AI to just remove the backgrounds from images that we might use and want to put in a different in, into a book cover. Whereas in the past, it took 10 or 15 minutes of painstakingly cutting, deep etching, cutting out the image from the background. Now, AI can do it in 10 seconds, right? Mm. And it's done, and you can use that image. So AI is already, has been a part of, of these design tools for a while. And yeah, absolutely. It's going to just become so much a part of it that you don't even know that it's AI anymore. Yeah, and it feels like people are only calling things AI when they haven't gone into the mainstream. So, for example, Canva, canva canva.com, many authors have been using for many years now. Canva is amazing. It has so many options. And that that thing you just said, and obviously it uses a lot of AI, and it now has a generative AI tool, but it also has a one-click remove background. So, I mean, I don't know why people don't understand that this stuff is AI powered in some way, but it that seems yeah. to be the point. It almost feels like in a year's time, it'll just be book design and you just use the tools. Like people haven't been questioning your use of Photoshop or yeah. in, in the past or whatever, have they, or, or, or any of these things. So I don't know. Th- how about you? What do you think, where will we be in a year's time? I mean, I guess the other thing to say is that the speed at which Midjourney and other tools are getting better, how do you see things being different in a year's time? You know, I, I wish I could predict that. It's so unpredictable because it is moving so quickly. I think maybe in a year's time, but I hope not, but maybe in a year's time, you might use your into the AI to just stick your book synopsis into a in some sort of AI and it will just create the best possible book cover just you know in a few seconds and it's done, right? There's your book cover. Here's you this was just this was your novel input, here's your output, this is the book cover, right? That could happen. In fact, that probably will happen, but it might not be in a year's time. It might be in three or four years' time, but that probably is what will happen in one way or another, where you just put in the the least amount of input and you get the best output. Yeah. I mean, I would say a year's time for sure. I actually, I mean, uh, sorry to tell you this, but at the moment, okay, so you can feed in a whole book 
to yeah. something like Claude, Claude 100K, and output a book description, you can also then yeah. say to it, please create me 15 prompts for book cover images that I could use here. And then you can use those. I mean, it, some of the, some of these models now can generate really good prompts for Mid Journey, and then you can go use that. There's still a question of font, and this is something that is the missing piece. I feel, but regardless, yeah. and this is the important point. Regardless, because this is the same for authors. Can you generate a book with one click? You almost pretty much can at this point. I mean, with nested stuff or code interpreter and all this kind of thing, there are ways to generate books very, very quickly. So this is the big question. If and when AI can do all of this stuff, are we worried about our livings as creators? Or are you worried about your business as a cover designer? And should authors be worried? Or how are you thinking about this future? Look, we can only work with where we are now, right? So we're adapting as we're going. I mean, we can't predict what it's going to be in it, in the future. And you're quite right in that for now, for right now, that the those AI engines, you, I mean, you probably could find a way to add text to the cover in, in a kind of way, but it doesn't, none of it works very well, right? And the amount of time and effort that it would take to create a really good and effective book cover using only AI inputs, I mean, it might be possible, but it's not very easy. And for now, it's still easier to just get a book cover designer to put your book cover together for you, right? Even or even now, you, anybody, right? For, for however long, anybody could learn Photoshop, right? Any author could learn how to use Photoshop, can learn how to design book covers and could create their own book cover, right? That has happened, that will continue to happen. But that doesn't mean that that's what every author is going to do. And I guess it's the same now. It might become much, much easier to design a book cover or to write a book, whatever it might be. However, for many, many people, that's not what they're interested in. You know, an author very often wants to write their book, writes a great book, but doesn't really want to go into the nitty gritty of figuring out how to put together the best cover for their book, right? It's I guess it's the same as it's possible now to put together your whole interior house design, but there are still interior designers around, mm. right? That are really good at what they do and get lots of business. And I, I kind of feel it'll be the same with this, right? It will be easier to design your own book cover. It will be easier to put together a book, but there will still be a place for professional cover designers and there will still be a difference between the people that are writing a book using AI and the people that are actually writing a book with the help of AI, but really putting in the time and effort to write the book. Just as you know, we're graphic designers and although we're using AI to help us put together a cover designer, we're still not using AI to just put together the whole book cover. For now, that's a little bit of a way away. And even if you did, this is how I see it, is even if you were using AI tools for a whole load more stuff, like generate a new custom font for every single cover, which I'm sure will be possible at some point. It may be possible already. I don't know. But it, it's not about that. It's like you said, it's about being the human involved in the process. And there's this kind of meme going around. I'm sure you've seen it, is that your job will not be taken by AI. Your job will be taken by a human using AI. <laughs> yeah. Because the tools enable us to do far more than what we can do alone. And that's how I see it. It's like this, this incredible booster almost of our own creativity. And like I'm I love Mid Journey and I'm probably on Mid Journey far more than the average author. I mean I'm on it like every one of my little I, I guess guilty pleasures in the morning is I'll pop on X. I use X for a lot of these images, AI stuff, and I'll find someone's prompt, like a new prompt that I've never seen before with a really cool image. And I'll go put it in Mid Journey and see what it is and like just have a little re-roll of it and just enjoy the process of creating uh, something new you know what i mean yeah i, I mean i kind of like that shows you like for us that's that's work <laughs> so, yeah, so that's for me, fun I'm, for me <laughs> i'm never on my journey unless i have to be on my journey i'm never on my journey unless we 
can't quite get something right with stock photos. Or it would be just better if we use, could create a particular kind of image using my journey. That's the only time I'm on my journey, which so I mean that shows you. Yeah, yeah, and that I mean, but it, in terms of creativity, it's the human and our, it's still our imagination and what we and our and also you as a designer, it's your taste. I did want to mention taste because yeah. I can generate loads of images, but I still send them to Jane, and Jane makes better image better covers because I don't have the not just taste, but the experience. Like you said, you've looked at so many thousands of, of covers, tens of thousands of covers, and you know the market. And again, it's the same with authors. Like we know our readers, we know about what we want to achieve with our creative vision. So yeah, I just want people listening to kind of feel it's look, it's okay. Even if the tool can do it all, we're not worried. But I did want, before we finish, because we're almost out of time, if an author wants to work with their designer so a lot of authors already have other designers i mean obviously if they come to you they can choose not to use ai you have that option or they can use that as part of the process but if an author has a designer and that designer is like oh i don't know what are some ways that an author might encourage their designer to play with this like should it just be come over read your blog posts (laughs) (laughs) maybe uh maybe i mean i kind of i kind of feel not every cover needs AI, right? So if you trust your designer and your designer is able to produce a really effective book cover for you, I mean, what if the cover only needs, is a text-only cover or, or it would work best with a hand illustration or the perfect photo already exists, then AI isn't required, right? It might just it might not be the best option. It's As I see it, AI is just another tool, right, that we can use to create book covers, that we can use as, as, as part of our toolbox. So I feel like if you trust your cover designer, then and if they don't need to use AI and you're still really happy with the result, then that's fine, right? But if if they're if you're not happy with the result, or if you're looking at other sort of options, and if they're open to it, I would absolutely recommend that they look at your podcast and they look at James from Go On Right and yeah sure look at the blog posts that that I've put out but whatever it might be just to kind of get different viewpoints and different opinions I think often like on X everyone's kind of in their own echo chambers and and you might find that you just happen to be in the echo chamber with AI being terrible and it's going to take over everything and maybe it's time to just step out of that and look at just look at other viewpoints and opinions and see that there are other things out there. It's like I often think that sometimes you might see something on Twitter where there's been some sort of, a, sorry, on X, where there's been some sort of outcry over a AI was used on a particular cover. And you might see this sort of feedback loop of how could that publisher have done that or that author have done that? It's terrible. But at the end of the day, 99% of readers, I promise you, don't care where the image came from that's on that cover. It's really like the last time you bought something and maybe you saw an advertisement for it and you bought something from it. Did you think on this ad that I'm looking at now, where did they source the image for this ad? Because at the end of the day, the book cover is just an ad for the book, right? So hmm. I think don't worry about <laughs> too much. The it's Look at other viewpoints, look at other opinions, really consider the bigger picture of what the job is of the cover. If the author really it, it, it wants the designer to look into that you know, give the designer their own opinion about what they think of it and let the designer form their own opinion. If they still don't want to do that, then either trust them to come up with something great that doesn't require AI or or look for another designer. Mm, Absolutely. Right. So where can people find you and everything you do online? The easiest way is just the website, demonza.com. That's where everything's happening. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Damon. That was great. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. Appreciate it. It was uh, great to chat to you. So I hope you found the discussion with Damon interesting. And of course, you must make your own decision around your usage of AI images. Check the terms and conditions of any site you use. If you want to know how to use AI images for marketing, check out the AI Images for Ads webinar with Mark Dawson and James Blatch. That's a free webinar, thecreativepen.com forward slash AI webinar 23. Links in the show notes. It is on the 13th of September 2023. So this is short notice, but you can also find AI Images for Ads in the Ads for Authors course. So I'll redirect the link 
thecreativepen.com forward slash AI webinar 23. Once again, I do not do tech support for AI. So if you are AI positive and you want to learn more about what authors are doing, check out the Facebook group AI Art for Authors. Right on Monday, I'm talking about producing audio drama with Joanne Phillips, something that super fascinates me. I have kind of had a bit of a desire to do an audio drama for a long time. If you're into audio or writing for a different market, or if you're considering turning your book or screenplay into an audio drama, which is much cheaper to make than a movie, so it's more likely to happen, you'll really enjoy our discussion. In the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>